Thank you for listening to The Hive Podcast. My name is Natalie Nahai, and in the second series, I'll be exploring our relationship with the living environment. These 10 intimate conversations will touch upon everything from psychology, sustainability, and human behavior, to political and economic systems, and the narratives we inhabit to make meaning of our place in this world. Join me each week as we explore these topics and more. And if you like the show, please do rate or review it as it helps to reach new ears. For additional resources and to find out more, visit natalinahai.com forward slash The Hive Podcast or tweet to me at Natalie Nahai. Thanks for listening and I hope you enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to The Hive Podcast. I'm really excited about today's show because I'm actually getting to interview a very dear friend of mine who I went to college with and he's a very special guest. This episode, I'll be talking with Professor Ben Garrod, an evolutionary biologist and primate conservationist, who's also a broadcaster for television and radio, and who's written several fantastic books covering a broad range of subjects from evolution and anatomy to animal behavior and natural history. Ben is the Professor of Evolutionary Biology and Science Engagement at the University of East Anglia. He holds a Master's in Wild Animal Biology from the Royal Veterinary College and his PhD at UCL focused on studying the early stages of speciation in island living primates through molecular and anatomical changes. He started broadcasting in 2014 with the award-winning BBC4 series Secrets of Bones, and he's since presented a range of TV shows including Attenborough and the Giant Dinosaur, The Day the Dinosaurs Died, and Hyper Evolution, The Rise of Robots, as well as the Bone series and Human Hive on BBC Radio 4. In 2018, he released six children's book in the series So You Think You Know About Dinosaurs, and his new book, The Chimpanzee and Me, will be published this summer. So really exciting stuff going on there. Ben, thank you so much for joining me today to chat about your ideas, your research and your adventurous life. No worries. Thank you. That seems to be the most impressive introduction I've ever had. I <laughs> wondered who that guy was then. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> I want to do you justice because, uh, you know, <laughs> it's good to be able to do that. <laughs> um, I want to kick off um, by actually sharing uh, one of the early stories that you told me, which I vividly remember, about your first encounter with the wonderful Dr. Jane Goodall. Um, and it struck me because of the way in which you connected with one another. I wondered if you might be happy to share that. Uh, that story are with us now. Of course, definitely. So I was a third year animal behaviour student and like many students, I had my heroes. It was Diane Fossey, it was Jane Goodall, of course it was David Attenborough. But Jane Goodall herself held this really special place in my heart and I wanted to be the next Jane. Now, for those who don't know, Jane was a young biologist in the 1960s who went to Tanganyika, which is now Tanzania, and was the first person really to study great apes in the wild in any real depth. I mean, it had been done a little bit before, but people had given up and said it just wasn't possible. Whereas Jane went out there and blew our socks off in the scientific community. She, she saw chimpanzees hunting for the first time. She, she saw non-human primates making and using tools. This really helped us redefine what it meant to be not only uh, human, but our place in nature. So as you can probably gather, she was a bit of a thing for me, Jane. Now, during my university, I obviously worked very hard, but... I also had several other jobs. I worked in a pub. I also worked as a silver service waiter at one of the big uh, colleges at Cambridge University. Now, I'd just been away for three months. I'd broken my wrist, so obviously couldn't lift big, heavy plates. And my very first night back, the whole hall was decked with quite weird, quite cliche African ornamentation. There was leopard print uh, tablecloths and knickknacks <laughs> all over the shop. It was horrific. And I asked what the reason was, and my boss said, oh, some, some monkey lady's here this evening. Who's the monkey lady? She, oh, Jane someone? Oh, oh, okay. Um, is it Jane Goodall? Yeah. As a, <laughs> as a staff, we weren't meant to talk to the, to the uh, people we were serving unless they spoke to us first. It really was that archaic. It probably still is, I'm afraid. Um, and I've served a whole load of uh, wonderful, posh, incredible, amazing, all different, you can name them. I served them and very rarely spoke to them. Stephen Fry, Ian McKellen, all these people. So that all changed this evening when I was serving Jane. 
And I'm not the most nervous person in the world, as you know, <laughs> but I had to serve my hero soup. And I was shaking when I served the Jane Goodall soup. And she turned around very sweetly halfway through me serving uh, ladles of soup and said, hello, um, what's your name? All I could squeak was Ben. <laughs> Hi, Ben, my name's Jane. To which I replied, I know. <laughs> I lost all credibility that evening. Now, throughout the evening, serving her different courses, we'd snatch a little bit of conversation each time. What are you doing? Oh, you're studying animal behavior. What do you want to do afterwards? I want to go to Africa. I want to be like you, Jane. I'm really sorry. You must hear this a million times a day. And then I would go and serve somebody else soup or vegetables or whatever. And across right to the point we got to coffees and then mints, we'd had a little bit of a conversation. And she finally said, right, sit down which I wasn't meant to do at all. Mm. She pulled a chair all the way across the high table floor and um, it echoed through the chamber. It was terrible. <laughs> Sat down, took one of my hands and said, right, what are we going to do with you? I said, Jane, I just want to go to Africa in some way, shape or form and I just want to study apes. And she took my hand, she looked at me in the eyes for probably about 30, 40 seconds, I don't know. And I can remember thinking, I'm not sure what to do now. As a primatologist, does she want to outstare me? Do I have to outstare her? Do I need to be dominant? Does she need to be dominant? And all this crazy emotion was running through my head. I don't know what she was thinking. And she just broke off and said, okay, we'll sort something. And then wow. two months later, I was, I'd was i finished my degree. I was in Northwest Uganda running a huge program, running uh, ecotourism, research, habituation for wild chimpanzees, law enforcement, education, and that was it. And it was all through serving Jane Goodall's soup that I managed to get the, the, the job of a lifetime. <laughs> that is absolutely extraordinary. And the moment at which you lock eyes and she just held your gaze for that, for that time. Um, sounds very powerful. I just wanted to yeah include that because it's an extraordinary story. And so since then, you've actually lived and worked all over the world from Central Africa, working on great ape conservation with the Jane Goodall Institute, uh, Southeast Asia for orangutan conservation, Madagascar, where it was about marine life. And you've even been to the Caribbean, where you studied introduced monkeys. So what is it that moved you, if you can narrow it down to maybe a couple of reasons, to explore the natural world in this way, and, you know, primates in particular? I grew up, well, as you did, Nat, on, in coastal East Anglia. And as a mm. kid, I spent a lot of time on the beaches with my grandparents and... Uh, I think it was that real physical proximity to nature that just inspired me. My grandfather wasn't a an academic in any way, shape or form. He was actually a mole catcher. Oh, wow. <laughs> but he didn't know the answers to the questions that I had. So we used to together make up these incredible stories that were absolute rubbish and, and full of lies. But we used to make these incredible fun stories. And I realise now that we gave narrative to science. We gave the narrative to the natural world, even as a three, four, five-year-old. And that's still with me now. And I think this area of exploration of the natural world and trying to put a narrative to it has really inspired me and I've always been in an environment where through mum dad and the rest of the family they've always said and I'm so fortunate for this you can do whatever you want mm. so growing up in those pubs I was always told if you want to go study the other side of the world you can if you want to be a doctor totally if you want to be an astronaut then have fun in space and looking back it was an incredible thing for them to do but it just it just set me on my path and as to why nature I don't know I feel so calm so relaxed and so so at ease with myself when I'm surrounded by the natural world. And I love the way that you that you were inspired with your grandparents and your grandfather in particular to to make stories, to interpret and relate to your natural environment. And what do you think it is about the ways in which we make stories and narratives that connect us to the natural world that so... Um, I kind of want to use the word heart-opening because it does give us a sense of peace and connection. And I think in a day-to-day sort of rhythm of life we, we lose that a lot we lose this connection um so what is it about the power of story do you think that's so important about reconnecting us with nature i think the power of story is fundamental to us as a species we can track the storytelling um aspect of humanity as far back as as, as records go we know that that aboriginal tribes are still tell incredible stories that go back millennia and the same with with traditional uh, north american tribes as well we we have this yeah. inherent not only ability but this drive to tell stories and something that always absolutely perplexes me is that we get into science and we we drop the narrative because science is clinical <laughs> science is quantifiable but actually it's the greatest story ever told the story of the universe being created the story of humanity evolving from from something that looked more like a chimpanzee. If, if, 
if we can't tell stories in science, we're doing it wrong. So I think it's this inherent human quality to to tell stories with the greatest story that can be told, the science around us. And I think I love the idea of marrying these two up and it, it just works. Mm. And I think what's interesting is when you start to see, it's kind of like a fine line or, or a delicate dance between our desire for story making um, and extracting meaning from what we observe, what we experience, and then making inferences that, that maybe take projection a little bit too far. So for instance, and I don't know where that line is, but it, it really fascinates me. So um, I read recently a fascinating paper in the journal Nature, written by an international team of researchers who were observing chimpanzees in Guinea and Guinea-Bissau and Liberia and Cote d'Ivoire. And they were, they were witnessing these chimpanzees throwing stones into certain hollow trees and creating rock piles reminiscent of a cairn that we might build. So, you know, when people build stacks of stones, it's something we've been doing for a very, very long time. Um, from something like that, which looks potentially to be a ritualised behaviour, what might we be able to infer? Is it taking it a step too far if we kind of go, well, maybe this is ritual, maybe this is meaning making that we're observing in other animals? Oh, no. As scientists, we very often have this very thick armour where it's a risk to say anything that can be misconstrued or that might be wrong. I almost have to whisper that. But it's OK to be wrong. Mm. We can talk about these things as people and as scientists, and they're not mutually exclusive. Mm. There's no reason why non-human primates can do things that are ritualistic. Now, I've often said to colleagues and friends uh, describing a piece of behaviour... And they'll come back and say, yeah, that sounds very ritualistic. What is it? I say, well, that's seen in chimpanzees. And sometimes you'll hear this, ooh, um, no, no. It's like, oh, okay, you've, you've just accepted <laughs> it was ritualistic, not knowing the species, but now you know it's chimp, it's not allowed. Mm. Um, I think we have to, we've got to a point now where, and again, back to Jane Goodall, when she first named her chimpanzees, David Greybeard and, and Flo and the rest of them, and she noticed that they were using tools and they were... Uh, hunting other animals within the forests. When she took this back to her, not her supervisor, Lewis Leakey, but colleagues back in, in, at the university in the UK, they absolutely ridiculed her for being, first of all, a young woman who's too uh, emotional anyway, oh. but also, of course, she's going to see crazy things that are wrong. She's given the animals names. The moment you start to see them not as subjects or, or as data points, you'll see all manner of crazy stuff. Now, we know now that that's not the case. And of course, they're, they're different individuals. You look at your dog or your cat at home, they're individuals as, as much as we are. I think oh. we're still coming to the point where we... We're becoming more able to look at these things, as such as the Cairn building, and make inferences that that we're more confident in. So yes, I totally believe that's ritualistic behaviour. I think it's very naive to think we've got this hugely rich human culture that it just appeared five and a half or six million years ago. We know for a fact that Neanderthals buried their dead and covered them in shells and seeds and red ochre. Wow. They were doing that because there was some level of... Of belief there. We know that in two or three locations they buried their dead children with um, horned animal skulls surrounding the children in, in the grave plots. Oh, wow. If you're not doing that for ritualistic uh, religious-like behaviour, then, then why are you doing it? I think there's uh, this wonderful, wonderful sort of stretched piece of uh, evolution, or cultural evolution there that yes, it hasn't started off why chimpanzees were going to church on a Sunday, but that didn't randomly start in, in humans either. I think that thing came from our ancestors. But at what point? I don't know. But it's a fascinating area and we have to open our eyes to that. Now, Jane has this wonderful story as well, where in the dry season, there was a tiny trickling waterfall in one of her hill, hill forest areas. But at the start of the rainy season, this tiny trickle turned into a rainbow fueled cascade. And she said that the first time she saw this, all of the chimps in the area would disappear and end up at the bottom of this little cascading waterfall on their back legs, holding onto saplings, swaying the trees and cooing whilst watching the water come down for hours and hours oh, and hours. So moving. And she said she's never published that. She's never written it up as a, as a, as a piece of science. She said, but they were, they were celebrating. They were not going as far as worshipping it, but... But in the same area, you have animist human beliefs where we celebrate the forest, we celebrate yeah. spirits, we celebrate things we don't understand. And is it a massive leap to go, chimpanzees are celebrating something they don't understand to the same thing with, with humans in many ways? And yes, we're more, we're more able to give it meaning. But this developing of cairns, this celebrating waterfalls, the, the dead rituals are all part of a sliding scale. And I think that's one of the most interesting areas of bioanthropology is when did the things that we think define us uniquely when did they start to develop in in our ancestors 
I love that story. I mean, it's beautiful. And I think what, what strikes me about it also is the degree to which now as a civilization, we have become in many parts of the world so disconnected from the living natural environment and so um, maybe anaesthetized to the beauty and the sacredness of what's there. So you mentioned like animist religions, this idea of everything having some kind of spirit or life force or whatever. Um, and I think... I think it's a deep shame that we've lost this sense of awe in many parts of our civilizations uh, and reverence for something which is profoundly extraordinary and beautiful and complex and rich. Um, and to, to then have the, the hubris to say, well, you know, this is, this is the height and pinnacle of intelligence and have that disconnection and then to allow that to then feed into what has now become a really um, problematic climate crisis. I mean, I thought to take it down that path, uh, do you think that there is something that we're missing from, for instance, in science, it's reflected really well. You described the fact that we have such a reluctance in mainstream science to ascribe narrative and meaning and beauty. But what is it about that, that, that we seek to be analytical and disconnected and objective, what seems to be a, a deep expense to us and all other species? Um, I think... The reason we do it as scientists, I understand why we do, is to give qu quantifiable data to things, to give uh, reliability to, to observations that we make. And we do need that, absolutely. But also we need to not lose sight of the of the story behind that. And it's really, I don't know the answer. And it's not mm. me saying we're all doing it wrong because we've all done it. And it's very hard to, to give meaning to certain things and to, to be brave enough to do that. And actually within the world we're in, most people don't want experts anyway, yet alone an expert who's waffling on about the religious behaviour of non-human primates. It's, we open ourselves up for, for as Jane did, sadly, is, uh, we open ourselves up for ridicule and for criticism. So I understand that we've done this, but I think as a wider concept, politically and educationally and, and scientifically, yes, we, we've, we've got this disconnect with the natural world. We, As you said, we are pumping pollutants and toxins and poisons into the very life-giving force that is is around us everywhere the, the the natural world because we don't see the cause and effect how many people would still would still use all the plastics they use would still use all the microbeads would still throw away all these uh, pollutants if they thought it's actually depriving us of oxygen if they thought they were pumping carcinogens into our environment i don't know but mm. we don't believe we're doing that. And that's incredible. It's an incredible thing that us as a species have that incredible confidence. And denial. I mean, it's kind of like these psychological, um, I guess, psychological straitjackets that we wrap around ourselves and then live in denial of. Absolutely. But and then also we, we, we have this duality all the time where we are part of the natural world and we in many ways are doing things that are natural to a species but also we expect to set ourselves aside and have a higher level of understanding and and accountability and almost global stewardship which yeah we do yes. but that's a huge amount to ask for a species we see elephants destroying habitats all the time and what worth and if, it, if elephants have been taken away from an area the habitat grows back really quickly and becomes very thick secondary forest you reintroduce for, uh, elephants they destroy that within a year or two mm -hmm. you've got another big iconic intelligent species there that destroys habitats at, an, um, at a rate that isn't uh, uh sustainable yeah, yeah. But we don't expect elephants to limit what they do. And I'm not saying, of course, we're very different. But it's, it, I do come back to this idea that it's, we do tread a very fine line constantly. And we have made it very hard for ourselves. We're, in many ways, a victim of our own, of our own uh, success. And we talk about what's natural. Well, this is natural for us. What's natural for a chimp or natural for a uh, humpback whale or a, an eagle is just as natural for us to develop all this technology, to develop all these plastics, because it makes our life easier or better or more lucrative or whatever so it's it's so i don't know the answer it's so difficult but actually we're doing what comes natural to us so fascinating i'm, I'm also curious to ask because obviously you, you write um a lot of books and you create a lot of content especially also for younger audiences which i find really exciting and inspiring um and i'm wondering if you have found that younger people and children's perception of their relationship with the natural world has varied dramatically from adults. So, for instance, I know that, that um, all the climate strikes, school strikes that have been happening around the world that have spread to everywhere bar the Antarctic, <laughs> um, you know, that there, there is something there and there's this sense of 
if we're talking about natural drive of, of younger people having the natural drive not only for survival, which now feels like it's under immediate threat, which finally, you know, is waking people up to the problem, but also to affect change in their in their environment, to come together to to create something that that is important. Um, in what ways do you find younger people engaging differently to the way that adults are engaging? Oh, this is such a such a beautiful area of, of where we are as, as a species right now because there's this wonderful pushback as you said a global pushback young people are mm. angry they're angry that they're not being listened to they're angry that it's their future we're polluting and say we anyone over 18 is responsible for this and they're angry at all of us and they should be and we should feel bad and we owe it to them to, to make the change here. and i think the difference with these young people and there are so many out there as you said in 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 so many countries right now, there's Greta Thunberg uh, from Scandinavia, there's Dara McNulty from Ireland, there's Bella Lack from England. There's, I could name a hundred different young people easily who are more influential than some of our most senior politicians. Yeah. And that's because they're passionate, they're driven, and in their minds, they've got nothing to lose because we're already losing it. Mm. And I can't say any better than any of these young people. And, and the important thing is, none of these young people are older than 18. They're young people who, in the eyes of the law, aren't even adults yet. But look, they're changing yes. policy. They're changing the way we think because they care, because they don't have this, this stripped down idealism where you have to act a certain way to keep the job or to keep someone happy or to act in, in, a, in, a, in accordance with with society around you these kids are angry i'm not sure if i can say they're pissed off but they yes, are <laughs> yeah and rightly so and you know what i would stand behind these kids and i will stand behind these kids in everything they want to do because it's their world it, it really is and i genuinely think that it's not up to us scientists and us politicians anymore i think it's up to the young people who want to see the change and i do think that's where we'll see this change coming from so many of us especially those of us who are having to earn a living um have conflict of interest i feel this within myself so I have to travel in order to work. Um, so that means that I'm taking flights. Now I can offset that and I do by funding the planting of trees or offsetting my carbon emissions by helping to um, support people growing and training people to grow forest gardens. But it would be ideal if I didn't have to do that. And yet younger people don't have these considerations in the same way that people of a working age might. Um, so how do we, how do you kind of balance that as an adult with these other responsibilities um, and the work that you do, like how, yeah, I'm curious from a personal level, really. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> it's tricky, sorry. <laughs> it's really tricky. And anyone who says, I don't do this or that, they're, 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 we're wrong. We do do all these things. Yes. And I'm, I've just returned two days ago from West Africa, where I flew out to West Africa. I've done eight trips to West Africa this year. I, yes, I've offset that as, as best I can. But the work that I'm doing out there is to raise awareness for conservation. So it's, it's a really difficult uh, catch-22 in some respects. Mm -hmm. But it's making the differences where you can. Not everybody can afford to to plant trees but what you can afford to do is meat free mondays for example it's one thing where you make a tiny difference and yes. what i'm what i'm absolutely sick of is people saying oh yeah but uh if you don't use straws it's not going to save uh, polar bears is it <laughs> yes. it's going to make more of a difference than using the straws if you if you just stop using straws as a one person it will make a difference oh yeah but if i stop using cotton buds look at china like, that's that's not the answer. Just, just because someone bigger than you is still doing something doesn't mean you should stop doing anything. Any single thing that you as an individual or as a school or university or business or government or country can do makes a huge difference. And whether it's using a different soap or whether it's reducing the amount of meat you have or actually going veggie um, does make a massive difference, not only to yourself, but actually to the, the big chain. And it will have a knock-on effect. I can almost guarantee that. And by these little steps... These little steps combine and they form an avalanche of change eventually. So, yeah, I, I make the changes where I can. But as we all are, I'm still guilty of contributing to, to this global problem. But I'm trying to make a difference. And that's all we can do. No one's expecting you to go live in a hole and become a hermit. <laughs> we are a modern species in the modern world. We're very dynamic. It's offsetting that in whichever way you can. And it can be as little as stopping to use straws or it can be uh, replanting, replanting trees. It's finding your way of giving something back, I think is the important thing there. Mm. I'm curious with, with the things that you've experienced, with the work that you're doing, what your biggest concern for the future might be. Oh, Natalie. Um, Sorry. <laughs> my biggest concern for the future is that we don't act in time. We're 
a wonderful species in so many ways and we're capable of the most tender love and the most incredible creativity but also the most mind-blowing apathy in any species that I've ever encountered and I just worry that we we throw this idea around we've got 12 to 15 years left in order to make a difference before there are irreversible differences uh, irreversible changes in our environment and still people are responding by going yeah but look we've had global change in the past look at the dinosaurs like, yeah look at the dinosaurs <laughs> they're not here anymore <laughs> Um, that's my biggest concern. Of course, there are individual things in terms of specific pieces of pollution, specific areas of pollution and population, uh, population growth is a huge issue right now. But it's all down to apathy. That can all change if we are galvanized, if we want to make that difference. And that has to work at every level of society. But it doesn't matter where it comes from. That's the wonderful thing with these kids or these young people. That spark might come from a whole left field demographic, which I think it is. So my biggest fear is apathy, but I, I am the eternal optimist. I think we'll be all right because I, I have faith in the young people. I really do. Yeah. So what, what, if you're thinking about the vision that we can work towards achieving in an ideal world, because as you say, we are a modern society living in a modern world. We're technologically advanced and we haven't even talked about things like the development of technology like AI or green tech or whatever it might be. Um, but in the best case scenario, if there is realistically... Um, only a certain amount of stuff that we end up doing before or within this window of time. Um, what do you think realistically we can work towards achieving in terms of a vision for the future? Does it include things like choosing not to have kids, which I know a lot of my peers are choosing not to do because of the carbon footprint, the uncertainty of the future? Or, you know, what, what aspects might you draw upon and say, OK, um, this is a realistic future that we can hope to create together if we pull our act together enough. It's sustainability. And I think that's the important thing here. We still have a lot of room for a lot more people on the planet. And that's the reality there. Huh. But we don't at our current rate of usage. So in terms of the resources we're depleting, in terms of the, the, the sheer area of land we're dedicating to cattle farming, for instance, uh, if we reduced our use of meat or consumption of meat or became uh, more vegetarian or all vegetarian, that would have a huge global impact. If we actually stopped the, the reliance on single-use plastics, that would have a massive impact. It's the little things that makes makes a huge difference and they can all be done but they all revolve around this sustainability idea and maybe that's not having kids if that works for you then great maybe it means becoming veggie if that works for you then great but it's, it's there is no right or wrong that every single person has to abide by i mean you cannot oh. go out and say well how are we going to decide who has children who doesn't is it fair for you to say yes. in sub-saharan africa you have two kids and because i have two in 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 Spain or in, in Britain or wherever. It, it's, it doesn't work like that. But what we can do is we can, with and with the advance of technologies we have now, the ability to use things in a sustainable way, to make to make things from sustainable products, to, to live more locally. Yes, we are an international species and a cosmopolitan is, is at a global level now. But I hate the idea that you can have strawberries in Scotland in the middle of December. Yeah, it just seems insane, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, and it's that, it's, we, do we want to offset the idea that we have a sustainable future for humanity and for our, our planet? Or do you want strawberries any time of the year? And it's as simple as that. And how do you think we balance these sorts of more selfish, um, immediate gratification types of needs against a longer term values based desire for a sustainable future because the psychology there is so important and you mentioned earlier about apathy and I think that for me at least from a psychological perspective that becomes one of the largest hurdles to overcome. It does and we've created I think this is out of my area slightly but my personal belief is we've created mm. a social and political uh, environment or ecosystem in which we live where we're constantly reinforced to think for the short term our government mm. is four-year government and if someone mentions raising taxes or adding this or adding that because it'll help us in 150 or 200 years no one's going to support that because there's someone else from a different political party saying yeah but i'd rather have free education for kids and uh less tax now and most people will want to support that of course because we don't see the future we don't look 200 years down the line also it's very hard to do that and I don't know the answer to that, but I think we're being reinforced constantly to think about the here and now and the immediate future rather than the long-term future. And that's a really hard one. And you're right, 
and really nicely involves scientists and psychologists and ethologists and eco uh, economists and, and politicians. We all need to band together and think, right, how do we work together across disciplines, across political divides to actually make sure we're all OK? And I don't know the answer to that yet, but it would it would involve a huge turnaround in the way we act as a species, I think. And also, I think um, fundamental changes to our culture. And when you look at sort of some of the some of the messages that are coming out again out of these youth groups, a lot of it is revolving around the kinds of lives that we want to live and the meaninglessness of all of these short-term goals if we have a world that is uninhabitable. <laughs> and I think when you create, again, using psychology to create this stark contrast in which you have option A versus option B, suddenly we, we have more of a tangible sense of what it is that's at stake and what it is that we need to work towards. Um, and I think the immediacy and concreteness of that having two options, either we keep going down this track and this is where we end up, or we make short-term sacrifices for... Um, a more sustainable future when you put it in such concrete terms it becomes a lot easier to make those sorts of decisions I think I think so and also I'm going to be very controversial here and I'm probably going to get in trouble <laughs> from some people who employ me and manage me but here we go go for it <laughs> the real difference will change when we really see that in the west when the the big players on the in the international stage really take a hit I think there'll be a difference because we're seeing people in in right across the board, making changes. So uh, uh, Rwanda, for example, has just outlawed plastic bags, single-use plastic bags, because they want wow. to make an environmental impact. That's wonderful. That's a very small country. Why can't America do that? Why can't Japan yes. or Britain or France or any of these bigger players do the same thing that that wonderful little country in the middle of Africa has done? Because we don't care, and that's the reality, because we don't see the issue. When we had a beautiful February recently. Everyone in the UK was swimming in the sea and they were in shorts and T-shirts and everybody was so happy, apart from anyone who worked with climate change or the environment, mm. because there's a horrifying sort of foreboding there. But people see it as a good thing. It's only, and I'm not wishing this at all, but I think when we start to see real problems in these big decision-making countries that will finally act, and I hope it's not too late, I really do, but you've got... You've got governments who are real decision makers, but instead they're led by that thundering idiot, Trump, or they're spending two years fussing over Brexit and whether it means this, that or the other. And it's a re the reality is they've had the UK government has had one one major um, uh, debate on political uh, sorry, on climate change in the last two years. And only a couple of dozen people turned up out of 650. I saw that. And it's an extraordinary distraction. Yeah. Oh, entirely. And that's it. And I think until we really get the kick up the, the behind that we need, I don't see <laughs> us in not not the West, but predominantly the West making the changes we need to. And I think that needs to happen before before we see this real political momentum gather, unfortunately. Yeah. OK, so in terms of things that people can do, a single action, maybe, or your top three, because you have a wealth of different uh, inspiring actions that people can take. Um what would you suggest as individuals we can do in order to build a more resilient future today? Uh, the first thing I would say is at some point within the next seven days, go and spend at least one hour outdoors away from buildings and cars and roads. Put your phone in your pocket or leave it at home, whatever. But just go and engage with the natural world. Go and fall in love either for the first time or re-fall in love with the natural world because you have to appreciate what we might lose. That's the most important thing. It can't be this, this intangible uh, theoretical idea. It has to be something that's in front of you, you can smell, that you can see, that you can witness and, and experience. So first of all, go and get inside nature. Go and experience it this week, please. That's your homework. <laughs> Secondly is make the contributions that you can. I'm not asking you to go and save a tiger. You, you're probably not going to go out there and actually work in tiger, tiger conservation, and you don't need to, but there's something that you can do to make a difference, either to local commun human communities, local human communities, local uh, habitats, or local species uh, in terms of animals or plants. And if you can do one thing that helps any of those three areas in a positive way, that's making a huge difference. It might be a two-minute beach clean on the beach. Um, so the Marine Conservation Society in the UK 
do hundreds and hundreds of beach cleans every year. And we're talking thousands, tens of thousands of people getting involved doing two minute beach cleans. Each one of those people doing a two minute clean on a beach makes a fundamental difference to that small part of the habitat. You don't need to go and go to the Arctic and pick up uh, nylon from around polar bear's feet. I, I wouldn't advise it. <laughs> but you don't need to do these big grand gestures. It's something that you can do in your local patch. So it's first of all, going to fall in love with nature again. Secondly, go and, go and make a difference where you can. And the third is spread that message. Tell other people, tell your kids or tell your parents or tell your teachers or vice versa or tell your politicians. Spreading that word that you want change, that you need that change. And damn it, you're going to fight for that change. Make a difference where you can. Go and fall in love with the natural world all over again and then spread that message. I love the sound of that. I think that beautiful, powerful, multi-layered actions that people can take and I shall be taking those, especially the uh, spending an hour in nature because it's so easy to forget that it exists and it's so much more enriching in many ways than our built environments. Um, so if people wanted to get in touch with you or find out more about you, what are the best places to find you? I'm usually gobbing off on Twitter somewhere. If you're on Twitter, it's Ben underscore Garrod, G-A-R-R-O-D, or my website is bengarrod.co.uk, or you can contact me via the University of East Anglia. But um, I'm always interested in getting involved with projects and seeing how I can help or seeing how, uh, just seeing what's going on, especially with young people, the, the amount of work that young people are doing all around the UK, for example. So with, with the Jane Goodall Institute, we have something called Roots and Shoots, which is this wonderful youth group um, momentum or movement where kids are working with local habitats, local species and local people or communities, and they're making change. We've had over a million young people in the UK alone over the last 20 years involved with these projects. And across the world, we're in well over 100 countries. So I, I like hearing about that sort of stuff as well. But yeah, please always feel free to get in touch. Or if you see me on the street, maybe say hello. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to ask, just before we wrap up, um, just very briefly. So um, a big inspiration to many nature lovers has to be our beloved David Attenborough. What was it like working with him on the TV show Attenborough and the Din Dinosaur? Awful. He's a monster. Um, <laughs> no, he is. Now, he's inspiring to me, not because he's the Sir David Attenborough with a wonderful mm. voice you hear on TV. I oh, know, that. such a wonderful voice. He is, but, but more than that, he's... He's like a child. He's, he's not childish. He's, well, he is a little bit, but he's childlike <laughs> in his love for the world around him. And this constant drive to explore and explain and to give that narrative is just as intense as I see in these young people who are inspired. And the fact that he's got that right through his life to, to 92 and a half, as he tells me uh, he is at the moment, um, <laughs> is wonderful. And, but also on a, on, a, on a practical level, he was always the first one up in the morning down the hotel, getting the fruit juice for everyone at the breakfast bar. And very often the last one to bed at night uh, working late into the night very often he's a great laugh he's he's yeah he's a real icon for for the natural world and for giving that wonder and that that uh, that sense of awe and also that narrative as well so yeah he's the guy's a legend we all know he's a legend but he's a legend because <laughs> he's down to earth and loves the world around him and that's that's why he's so cool <laughs> Wonderful. Well, um, Ben, I would love to talk with you for hours because you just, um, we've only done some of the questions that I was hoping to ask you, but thank you so much for sharing your insight and your thoughts and your experience um, with me and with my listeners. Natalie, it's been absolutely lovely and I would love to come back on again. Thank you for listening to The Hive Podcast with me, Natalie Nahai. To find out more about today's guest and the topics we explored, you can visit the show notes page at natalienahai.com forward slash the hive podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please do give it a rating and you can join in the conversation with the hashtag hive podcast. Thanks again for listening and I look forward to sharing more with you in the next episode. Bye.